So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Glad you could join us. I'm extremely honored to have Dr. Dina Modi here to speak. Uh, Dr. Dina Modi is the medical director of the Cytopathology Laboratory at Houston's Methodist Hospital. Um, and she's also the Ramsey Chair of Pathology there. She is a past president of the American Society of Cytopathology um, and has been a member of the executive board of the ASC. She has received the Papa Nicola Award, the President's Award, and Excellence in Education Award from that society. Um, she has also extensively participated with the College of American Pathologists, including chairing the Cytopathology Resource Committee and Anatomic Pathology Cluster. Um, she has received the Lansky Award for her leadership in cytopathology and the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2009 from CAP. She's currently the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Society of Cytopathology and on the editorial board of several psychology and pathology journals, um, and also uh, was on the Cytopathology Question Writing Committee of the American Board of Pathology. Uh, she has over 115 peer-reviewed publications and over 250 presentations, abstracts, and invited lectures at national and international levels. Um, We'll see this, I think, a little bit later, but in March 2014, she published a comprehensive 800-page cytopathology textbook, Diagnostic Pathology, uh, pathology Cytopathology by Amerisys, um, which is now in its second edition, which means it must be quite popular. Um, and she also co-edited the third edition of Clinical Cytopathology um, with her mentor, Dr. Ramsey, um, published in 2017. Um, and with no further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Modi. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, let's get uh, started uh, with cervical cancer screening and the paradigm shift we are in the middle of as we speak. I would like to thank Dr. Van Bush for inviting me to do this. Uh, so the, this, these are the latest U.S. Preventative Task Force guidelines that are U.S. specific that came out back in uh, July. Uh, August, and as you can see, for the first time in the United States, we have a primary screening option using just HPV testing. Uh, of course, we have two other options. One is PAP only, and one is co-testing in women over 30. I, do, I will be talking about HPV testing and the various platforms. I do not have any conflict of interest with any of the vendors or products or vaccines that I will mention in this presentation. My only conflict is that I do have two textbooks from which I have royalties. So for the purpose of this talk, this is sort of the uh, sequence I will follow and I'm not going to read it, uh, but we'll start with the historical perspective. And now that we are in the age of vaccination, what's going to be our future screening strategies in different parts of the world? So a little bit of history, as you can see, it, it all started when George Papanicolaou emigrated to the United States and started working at Cornell. And uh, uh, it was only till in 1954 that the American Cancer Society endorsed the PAP test for cervical cancer screening, after which it really took off. Zurhausen published the first link between cervical cancer and HPV in 74. And then he demonstrated 1618 in cervical cancer and ultimately went on to win the Nobel, share the Nobel Prize in medicine and physiology with the human papilloma, with the HIV guys. Uh, in the meantime, things have progressed and uh, the first prophylactic HPV vaccine was approved in 2006 in the US. And in 2017, some parts of the world went on to primary HPV screening. Uh, the PAP test uh, has been around for 65 years. We know what the problems are, but it is the single most effective test. And no matter what part of the world it was introduced in, we've seen a significant drop in cervical cancer rates and deaths. Unfortunately, there are parts of the world that you see in the brick red and the bright orange that uh, uh, still have high cervical cancer rates and deaths. And so... Uh, we are not there yet uh, in eradicating a disease that's easily preventable and cured if thought early. While the PAP test was successful in the United States, it did be become a money maker for certain laboratory industries. And there, were, and there were some bad practices that were used. And this was exposed by Walt Bogdanovich on November 2, 1987, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. 
Since then, we have congressional hearings and ultimately the clinical laboratory improvement amendments of 1988 were published, which really cleaned up the whole uh, PAP, uh, the, the whole business of doing PAP testing in the United States. So it was all for good. It also was the impetus that drove the first Bethesda conference because prior to that, there were different terminologies being used in the US and all over the world. Some were using the PAP class, some used dysplasia, some used CIN. So this was the first time when a group of thought leaders in cytology met in Bethesda, Maryland and came up with the first nonlinear terminology, naming, namely the Bethesda system, where the concept of atypical squamous and glandular cells was introduced uh, and uh, it has been adapted worldwide uh, uh, since then. It was all the CLIA 88 was also the impetus for new technology. We all knew the problems with the conventional PAP test. And so industry realized there was some money to be made in this and uh, a lot of good could be done. So they we had we now have two FDA approved uh, liquid based uh, uh, preparation devices uh, for cytol cerv uh, cervical PAP test. Uh, it's test not smear anymore if you're using the liquid base and they also have their own automated screening devices and about 98% uh, of the labs use one or the other of the uh, in the United States use one or the other of the technology and all of the larger labs use uh, the Im imager screening followed by manual screening I run a large commercial lab which covers all of Texas. I do over 200,000 PAPs a year and over 200,000 HPV tests a year. So I have it all in my own laboratory, including multiple HPV testing platforms, which we will get into. Uh, so let's start, get to the subject, HPV facts. There are over 200 genotypes, but it is the 40 anogenital types that are in the business of making trouble in this area. Most genital HPV types occupy a single genus with 50 within the 15 species, and this is based on the Elvard capsid gene, which I'll tell you a little bit about. The genotypes from the same species share about 60% or more of the nucleotide sequences, since they have similar biological and pathological properties. So in other words, they're kind of closely related and can have some cross-reactivity when it comes to testing and vaccination. We started out with the 13 high-risk HPV types, which belong to either alpha-7 or alpha-9, and the order of frequency worldwide, but it can vary. Though 16 is the most common worldwide, 18 is not necessarily the case. There are parts of the world where it's not 18 as the second most common. And then type 66 and 68 were added later to that high and intermediate risk group and that may have created some issues because type 66 you see in a lot of high grades but somehow it's not showing up in the cancers and so here is the dendrogram of family tree if you wish of the uh, papilloma virus and you can see they kind of occupy this one area in other words they're kind of closely related first cousins if you will whatever uh, and this becomes important later as i talk about the subject uh, here is a nice uh, diagrammatic representation of the, the um, uh, of HPV, which is a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus. Uh, it has the late regions, which are uh, which are the major and minor capsid protein, uh, indicated by L1 and L2, and these are the ones that are used in the business of HPV testing. The primers are made to these regions, L1 especially, and in vaccination. But the process of carcinogenesis, in other words, the troublemakers are actually the early regions, especially E6, E7. And I'll tell you a little bit about it in a few minutes. So how does HPV go about its business? So here is again a schematic representation from Nature Reviews. You have the reference. Uh, the infection actually takes place in the basal layer of, of the cells and the, uh, the infection actually proliferates in the nucleus. The cell maturation process is really important for the virus to thrive. So as the cell matures, the viral particles replicate and ultimately when the cell reaches the surface, 
uh, the cell ruptures and infects other cells or the partners. And this is what happens in most cases over 90% of the time. That's the kind of infection you see. It's transient. It goes away. However, in a small percentage of cases, for whatever the reason is, the genome gets incorporated into the host DNA. And now the cell cycle is altered with the results that cells are multiplying because there are no breaks left. And I'll tell you how that happens. And ultimately, you have immature cells on the surface. And that is what we see as a high-grade squamous infraepithelial lesion on cytology. So the mature cell type, which is the transient infection, is the low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And we no longer worry about it other than the fact that a persistent low-grade is a marker of maybe a high-grade higher up in the canal. The high grade is where the, uh, the virus is integrated and you have uncontrolled cell division. And so the cells have no time to mature. And now you have the less mature or the immature cell types on the surface, which is what gets scraped on the pap test. And that's why you see the little cells with the high NC ratio, or what we refer to as high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. Interestingly, the higher the grade of the lesion, the viral copy number actually drops because remember I told you that cell maturation is really important. So unlike HIV, where you can use the viral copy load to monitor the disease process, it's exactly the opposite in human papilloma virus. So that's why we don't use viral copy numbers because the highest numbers are in the low grades, which is what we don't worry about those anymore. So here is the process. It's uh, the cell cycle, which normally goes on. But under the influence of E2F, now it eggs the cell to start multiplying. And normally there is uh, E uh, retinoblastoma gene, which tells the stop cell to stop dividing when it's, it's not its turn. And if in the event that the cell goes ahead and divides, you have P53, which uh, induces apoptosis and tells the cell, hey, you know, you divided out of turn, so you will die. Unfortunately, under the influence of E6 and E7, those breaks are gone. And now you have an uncontrolled cell division, which is why we see the immature cells all the way to the surface. And there are other feedback mechanisms involved, which re results in an increase in P16 expression. Now, P16 can be seen in other cancers, but for HPV-related disease, especially in the mucocutaneous areas, it, it is used as a surrogate marker for HPV-related disease. Now, just because there is an HPV infection doesn't mean that the patient is going to have cervical cancer. In fact, the majority of HPV, over 90% are cleared over a 24-month period and even more over a 48-month period, including 16, 18, and 45, which are really the bad actors uh, uh, in this business and the other types. So they all ultimately clear in a majority of the patients. Uh, this is a figure that kind of shows you, you know, the cumulative incidence of cervical cancer. This was an article about Creedy and all, uh, and it was a very unfortunate experiment that occurred in New Zealand where these women were followed for 30 years without any treatment. Uh, they, they had high grade, uh, a, a cohort of women got the treatment, another one did not. And as you can see, there was about a third of them that went on to develop cervical cancer. Uh, in other words, a CIN3, it's a slow, for most part, is a slow moving process. And over a 30 year period, anywhere between 30 and 40% of the women went on to develop cervical, invasive cervical cancer. So just having high grade doesn't mean you're automatically going to get cancer. So when you look at this uh, diagram, uh, which although it's from 2006, it still holds true. When you're doing the HPV test, you're basically picking up, especially a DNA-based test, you're picking up every transient infection and the significant infections that will not clear. So you, you're going to pick up every infection. 
uh, if you have an E6, E7 based messenger RNA HPV test, and there is one, there are a few on the market, including one in the US that's FDA approved, uh, if you're getting a little bit more specific, but still not enough. Uh, a second level of test, uh, like the heat shot proteins, whatever that are increased in cancer, is really what we know, and the most promising of those are the methylation markers, but they're not yet ready for, ready for prime time to use uh, <coughs> in a worldwide screening program. So th th there's more happening uh, on it. So you really want to catch the HPV infections that are going to progress and treat those rather than every transient infection. Uh, again, the, uh, important to remind you that as the degree of dysplasia progresses, the E6, E7 expression goes up, up but the virus product production actually goes down. And since the HPV-based tests are clinical cutoffs that are used, uh, there is a potential that you could have a high grade of cancer that is has a low viral copy number that's below the clinical cutoff and you will have a false negative. And guess what? It happens. Okay, so in a nutshell, a woman who is sexually active, her lifetime risk of HPV infection is around 80%. Majority get cleared. There is a small percentage in this blue gray that will persist and a still smaller percentage that will go on to develop a high grade, and about a third of those over a 30-year period will become invasive. So when what we are seeing now is a shift from trying to catch the high grades and cancers to checking for an infection that is responsible for most, but not all, cervical cancers. So what do we have on the market? Well, in the United States, these are the five that are FDA approved. You can read for yourself. Most of them are DNA based, except for Aptima, which is the messenger RNA based uh, uh, testing. It tells you hybrid capture two was the first one. It had the 13 types with no genotyping. In other words, it told you positive for high risk type. And if you wanted to do genotyping, there was a separate test. In the United States, with the availability of especially the COBAS and the Aptima, uh, hybrid capture two. Uh, usage has dropped dramatically. There's only a handful of labs in the country that still use it. All the big commercial labs, including mine, do COBAS or Aptima. I have both the COBAS and the Aptima programs. The latest one on the block is on Clarity, which just got its FDA approval uh, in February uh, uh, of 2018, and that's for sure path specimens uh, only. And th this slide shows you the various HPV probes to the various HPV types. And the COBAS automatically gives you um, the genotyping also, i.e. 16, 18, or the other 12 types. Now, do these things cross-react? Of course they do. The manufacturer is not going to tell you that because once the things are, once the platform's on the market, then people start finding that, oh, it cross-reacts with this and that. So I have very little data on the BD on Clarity, which is the new kid on the block. But we know that Hybrid Capture 2, which had the largest primer, had the most cross-reactivity issues. And guess what? It cross-reacts with 611, the lowest spike. So Vista, which was the next one, had some limited cross-reactivity issues with the lowest type. Cobas, interestingly, does cross-react with 642 and a few others. Aptima has fewer cross-reactivity issues, but it still does, and we're discovering them. And BD on clarity, we don't know yet. This becomes important when you go, go to primary screening. And these, these are what the machines look like. Like I, like I said, in my lab, I have two of the Cobas and one of the Aptima. I don't have the on clarity yet. We got rid of hybrid capture in 2013. And these platforms are very versatile. I'm not doing an ad for anyone. They do actually more than one assay. So it's not just HPV. As you will see, they'll do HIV, HCV, and a few other things, including even the Zika virus. So in the United States, we first started out in 2001 with the ASCUS triage. And this was based on the ALS trial, the ASCUS low-grade triage study. In 2003, we introduced co-testing in women over 30. Why? Because women over 30, young women are more sexually active and tend to have more partners. 
and are more likely to be HPV positive and they have transient infections that will go away. So 30, when life becomes more stable, was used as the cutoff. Primary screening 2014 is when the COVAS platform was first approved and then the second platform in 2018. And now we have the US preventative guidelines with primary screening as one of the choices. Here is a comparison on the sensitivity and the specificity of the various platforms when you compare with cytology at the level of CIN1 or P16 and cytology. And you will see that cytology and P16 typically have a much lower sensitivity than any of the high, uh, HPV testing platforms. Unfortunately, it's the specificity. So a positive HPV test because of the transient infections doesn't automatically mean high-grade disease. And you can see that on the table that the specificities are relatively low. Uh, reporting rates. Now, when you look at the different trials for these various platforms, you see that the reporting rates are very different. And that is because it depends upon where the trial was done. And in some trials, like the ALT, they used an enriched population to get to the results faster. So things might look a little uh, different. So the ALT trial, which was the ASCUS low grade, which was hybrid capture, the key now was the COBAS one, and so on and so forth. In the United States, the College of American Pathologists does a survey and publishes the reporting rate uh, and uh, a table giving you the fifth through the 95th percentile. And this becomes important for QA activity because you're supposed to benchmark your numbers with those of the nationally published numbers and stay within the bell-shaped curve. I'll get into that a little bit later. Now, remember I told you about the false negatives and why they occur because the viral copy load drops as the disease progresses. And sure enough, here are different international studies and it runs around 9.910%. So that 8 to 10% number of false negative rates in high grades and cancer will show up in different studies in different parts of the world. You really have to read the literature to find it. What about real world data? Well, here's some real world data. France versus Australia and Miller was my fellow. So it's my data. Quest Diagnostics, which is the largest commercial lab in the country. As you can see, 19% of the high grades and cancers were HPV negative. 15% of the cytologies were negative. In other words, both tests miss a certain percentage, but they miss a different percentage. It's not the same ones. No, even co-testing will miss some, and I'll show you. Uh, again, adenos actually do even worse uh, with a much higher false negative rate, both on cytology and on HPV testing. And adenocarcinomas are a slightly different animal compared to squamous. And as the age of the patient goes up, whether it's related to the primer, the clinical cutoff, whatever, the HPV positivity rate starts dropping. And this was a study uh, by Anderson and all in the European Journal of Cancer. I've given you the reference. And then there are certain types of adenocarcinoma, which in the past we kind of knew them as adenoma malignums, but now they are no, they're known as the gastric type of adenocarcinomas. The Japanese have done the best work on, the, on that and kudos to them that are totally different process. They're not HPV related. These are cervical cancers. There's a whole spectrum. They have that typical gastrin type of mucin, which sort of has a yellow tinge on cytology. But basically, they have nothing to do with HPV infection, and they follow a totally different pathway. They say in Japan, about 25% of the adenocarcinomas of the cervix are of the gastric type. The low end of the spectrum or the well-differentiated end is what we used to refer to as adenoma malignums or minimal deviation adenocarcinoma. In the United States, they say about 5% of the cervical cans and the cervical adenos are of this type. I suspect it's higher from, based on my experience. I think we, it's still it's relatively new, so not everybody recognizes it. And when I went back into my old files, I found a bunch of stuff that we had just called them adenocarcinomas, which were actually of the gastric types. Okay, so moving on, what was my experience on the COBAS platform? And here is my data, which shows if you round up the numbers for biopsy confirmed, P16 confirmed high grades in cancers. So we threw out the endometrial cancers, which have nothing to do with HPV. 
if you round it up, you're looking at 9.9%. In other words, cytology, we published it in Cancer Cytopathology in 2016. And here is a comparison between the data from the largest commercial lab in the country, which is Quest, and the third largest commercial lab in the country, which is Bioreference. The second largest is LabCorp. They have not published anything. But basically, the point I'm trying to make that using imager screened liquid based PAPs, cytology miss 9%. HPV testing miss 9%, co-testing miss 1%. So in the United States, since we are a very litigious society and you want maximum protection and we don't have a centralized program, would you rather be in the 1% or the 9%? Take your pick, especially with the long screening intervals. Uh, a few other facts based on the literature about HPV is not detected in 9 4% of cervical cancers for whatever reasons, and I've told you some of them. An additional 3.2% had rare HPV subtypes, which are not tested for. Remember, we're testing for the 14 types. And of course, 90% of endocervical adenocarcinomas are HPV positive. We know 10% have a totally different pathway. What about the RNA-based testing platforms versus the DNA-based testing platform? And I have the COBAS and the Aptima in my lab. And you will see that, yes, you know, they, they're, they're over 90% for the high grades and higher, but they do, the COBAS, which is a DNA-based test, tends to pick up a lot more positivity, and on for, which on follow-up showed benign or low grade. The Aptima picks up a little bit less of the noise, but nevertheless still does. So the follow-up biopsies on PAP-negative HPV positives, as you can see, there's a lot of noise that was picked up. And you can see the COBAS versus Aptima, the specificity is higher for the RNA-based testing, though the sensitivity can be lower. Something to keep in mind. So in, a, in the United States, we've had primary screening since 2014. I can tell you uh, with over 200,000 PAPs done in my lab this year, I had less than 100 requests for primary HPV screening. An important thing to keep in mind that the first generation test, which was the hybrid capture two, did not have an internal control. So without, if you were to go in the primary screening mode, uh, the a negative test may not necessarily mean no disease. You know, what if there's no DNA in there or there's too much blood or whatever or interfering substances. COBAS and others do have an internal beta globulin gene, but it's not epithelial spell specific. In other words, if somebody is having a lot of bleeding, the DNA from the white blood cells will give you a positive internal control, but doesn't mean that there are epithelial cells in there, so you could potentially get a negative test. And a few other uh, issues, so we, uh, that have been published uh, by Dr. N uh, Nair, Gulat, Wassam, and Davy, etc., who, who are part of the cytology education and technology consortium. These are representatives from the various cytology organizations that meet once or twice a year. Anyway, so what are the causes of false negative results? Of course, if there's no specimen in the wild, but if it's a different a pool, then what's the 14 type you'll give, you'll get a false negative. And then the low viral copy number I told you, and then the presence of inhibitors and limitation of an, uh, analytic sensitivity. There's all these lubricants that people use uh, yes, the manufacturers have tested the most common ones, but every day there's a new one on the market. So who knows what it's doing? There's all kinds of spermicidal gels, etc. So not everyone has been tested uh, on the HPV, various HPV platforms. What about false positives? Well, that's something I discovered the hard way when I started doing them. And I got a few phone calls saying there's no way this person can be positive or she's a virgin. Don't ask me why they ordered an HPV test on her. But nevertheless, I discovered that actually there are carryover issues, something which I was not aware of. And what do I and a few other things, but what do I, what do you mean by carryover issues? So if you did everything right. Uh, no cross-contamination, whatever. In other words, you, you followed exactly the manufacturer's guidelines and did everything right. If you have a very high positive right next to a negative, you potentially could have a false positive in that negative one. 
and on the Cobas platform just by being in that environment. Uh, for Aptima, it's 0.35%, and for Cobas, it is 0.71% to carry over issues. So as you can see, it's there in the product insert, but it's on bullet O page 40 something, or here's the Cobas uh, one, which is on page 14, bullet number 21. And who reads that, right? Except when you start getting a bunch of calls and the 200,000 taps. Uh, I did get my share of phone calls that I had to investigate uh, and figure out, you know, why these women were testing positive. And now it turns out, and then of course we already know about the cross reactivity with uh, the lowest types. And actually, the Europeans are also onto this. So here is a paper by Priestler, Lindsay, Bondi, et etc., that in their conclusion that says, despite manufacturer claims, all three assays show cross reactivity in primary cervical screening at age 30 or over. Cross reactivity accounted for one quarter of the false positive test results, regardless of the assay. So cross reactivity should be addressed in EU tenders as this primarily technical shortcoming imposes additional costs on the screening program. So yes, if you are a government sponsored program, if, you, if a third of your tests are going to become maybe false positives, you are due to crop, due to uh, whatever reason, then it's a huge problem. But in certain parts of the world, uh, that could mean even worse consequences for the women. Anyway, so what is the role of HPV testing and how it has evolved? So we started off with tri triage for ASCUS and then LOCIL in uh, postmenopausal women and secondary triage in certain situations. Then we moved on to co-testing where women over 30 years were co-tested and tested for and primary screening. But all this information has also resulted in risk stratification and management guidelines. And of course, we use it for quality improvement purposes in the lab. So let's look at all the different ways we use. Now, there is no doubt about the fact that a negative HPV test at time zero is a better predictor of no high grade or cancer five years out. And there's plenty of trials. So it is far superior to the PAP test. But keep in mind that at time zero, each one could miss a high grade or a cancer. And this is data from Kaiser Permanente uh, that the uh, people at NCI have used. And you can see that uh, based on the various combinations of PAP and HPV, you can stratify the risk of the patient for having high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion or invasive cancer. And here is a very nice table from the New England Journal article by Schiffman and Solomon. And as you can see that, that number 12 is kind of important because anything over 12 <coughs> is automatically high risk and, and they go to immediate colposcopy. Between 3 and 12, they go to earlier screening intervals and then the ones below that will get testing in 3 years or 5 years and in some countries 7 years and they're even thinking of 10 years. This is a more readable table, but uh, just to let you know that certain categories like high HSIL, atypical glandular cells, atypical squamous cells cannot rule out high grade uh, cancer on cytology are automatic high grade categories. And so they will go to colposcopy and biopsy right away here in the United States, irrespective of the HPV status. Okay, so how did we start with the triage? And the basis for that is the ALS trial, the ASCUS low-grade triage study. The low-grade arm of the study had to be dropped so uh, because 80-plus percent of the low grades were HPV positive, so you couldn't use it for triage. But they discovered that using HPV triage was the most efficient way because they picked up the same num almost the same number of high grades with ASCUS triage than they did with triaging everyone to colposcopy who had ASCUS. And that was the basis for that. And an important thing is the viral load is not a predictive of the severity of diseases. So even back in the late 90s uh, and 2000, when this trial was done, they realized that uh, the viral load doesn't work for HPV, unlike HIV, where they follow the viral loads. 
Okay, and this has resulted in all these management guidelines in the United States. The American Society of Colposcopy and Clinical Cervical Pathology publishes these. There's even an app available. The guidelines can vary in certain parts of the different parts of the world. So each country has its own guidelines. Uh, so I would urge you to follow whatever is going on in your country. But they look like this uh, and what I'm showing on the screen. And uh, there's an app available. You can go look at that. Now, are these guidelines being followed? And that is where the problem arises, because in spite of all these publications and apps and etc., cetera, uh, the clinicians out in the field were not following it. So actually, the CETC, which is the consortium of cytopathology organizations, your representatives, published the article and a very nice table showing in red when you don't do HPV testing and when you do in green. Uh, well, needless to say, I can tell you in my practice and speaking to my colleagues, it's not exactly being followed. Co-testing in women over 30 and test of cure. We start with age 30 before reasons I told you. If the PAP and the HPV are a double negative, you can go to five-year intervals. Or if the PAP is negative and the HPV is positive, you can call them back in a year or genotype them. If it's 16 or 18, then they go to immediate colposcopy. If it's one of the 12 other types, you call them back in a year and depending on what the results are, you will call for them. It's not recommended for women under 30 because of the increased prevalence of a transient HPV infections for the reasons I told you earlier. Co-testing uh, is also used as a test of cure in women who have had leaps and cones. So a, a two rounds of negative co-tests, uh, they go to routine screening, but any of them being positive, they go to colposcopy. Different versions of this are also used in different parts of the world to triage patients. For atypical glandular cells, HPV testing is not the primary management algorithm. You can use it in a secondary mode and a positive HPV with an atypical glandular cell usually points to a cervical pre-neoplastic or neoplastic condition rather than endometrial, especially in very and postmenopausal women. However, a negative HPV test doesn't rule out endometrial pathology or those 10% that turn out to be negative. So now moving on to the elephant in the room, primary HPV test screening. So this is the algorithm that the COBAS platform was FDA approved in the United States. If the HPV primary screen is done, if it's 16 or 18 positive, they go to immediate colposcopy. If it's one of the other 12 types, you reflex to cytology. If the cytology is negative, you call them back in 12 months. If the uh, cytology is positive at the level of ASCUS or above, then they'll go to colpo. If it's negative, they go to routine screening intervals, which is five years. This was on the basis of the Athena trial. There were some issues with the Athena trial, but the main concern was it's because of majority of the in HPV infections are transient, you're going to colposcope and biopsy a lot of women. And also with the longer screening intervals and an opportunistic screening program in the United States, uh, we were afraid, we are afraid that many women will fall to the cracks. Now, in other parts of the world, Australia, Europe, they actually have organized screening program where the computer sends out reminders and invitations to come get the pap test. We don't have anything like that in the United States. And of course, the concern is, yeah, there are some other things women are not going to remember, but they had their screening test five years ago or seven years ago. Uh, and uh, there is a second peak of cervical cancer, and we had not taken into uh, consideration the hysterectomy rates here. So th th there's some issues we are trying to figure out. But the current guidelines are, we have three choices, cytology every three years, HPV testing every five years, or co-testing every five years beginning at age 30. And no screening of hysterectomy and no screening over 65 or under 21 for a normal average risk person. Now, when you implement H an HPV screening platform, for those of you who are in laboratory medicine, you have to do all these accuracy and reproducibility and other studies. And here is what was done in Norway. They, they decided 
the HPV testing was going to be centralized to the four labs when they go when they went on to primary screening. So they were doing their reproducibility studies and they realized the reproducibilities were great. <clears throat> but I did notice one thing. Notice all four labs, there were five high cells out of a total of 33 in that reproducibility study that were te that tested negative in all four for whatever reason uh, in, uh, in all four labs. I don't know the reason for that. I couldn't tell from the paper whether it was low viral copy load or a different HPV type. That's a 10.5% false negative rate. So here you have it out in the world literature, but you really have to look for it before you will find it. All I'm saying is there's no perfect test. Each test misses a certain percentage. Just be aware of it. So are we ready in the United States? Well, we don't know. But one of the concerns in many parts of the world with primary screening is the colposcopy rates. And that's something that needs to be taken into consideration because no amount of number crunching is going to tell you what the ultimate outcome will be. So I decided to look at uh, my colposcopy and biopsy rates once we started ha offering them uh, the automatic genotyping, which we started doing in beginning March 2013. And sure enough, what we noticed was that for PAPs that were negative but HPV positive, we did see an uptick in the colposcopy and biopsy rates over and above the uptick in our volumes. Uh, and that difference was statistically significant. But when we looked at the outcomes of those positive HPV negative PAPs, yes, we did pick up more high grades, but that difference was not statistically significant. The point I'm trying to make is we did a lot of, a lot of unnecessary colposcopies were done in women who ultimately turned out to have no disease or a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, which is a transient ephemeral infection, which is going to clear on its own. And this is important. And we're beginning to see that in parts of the world that they're, they, that have gone to primary HPV screening, uh, the colposcopy rates have gone up. And actually, I'm told there are six-month waits in some parts of the world, or even nine-month waits uh, to get a colposcopy. So these are things that need to be taken into consideration because just because you're HPV positive doesn't mean you have disease. And as you can see, our uh, difference was not statistically significant. Now, this is uh, some slides Dr. Austin from UPMC gave me comparing the Kaiser Permanente data with his. And the green area shows the benefit of added benefit of PAP compared to HPV and etc. And you will see that in the NCI data, there's very little to be gained by adding PAP and hence the recommendation for primary HPV screening. Now this is the Kaiser data, part of their PAPs were conventional not, and part were liquid based. It was mostly hybrid capture data back then. When he compared it to his McGee women's data, and my data is much more like McGee women's, we're getting ready to put together a paper on it. Uh, you can see there's a lot more green, which indicates there's a lot to be gained by adding PAP. So a good PAP actually is quite informative. And uh, Dr. Austin compared his data to that from the Kaiser NCI data and said there's a lot more to be gained. And we actually, during the open comment period, uh, we commented on those and, and they did listen to us. And, and so we do have a co-testing option currently in the United States till we figure out everything. But it is important to realize that H, a negative HPV test, which is a DNA-based one, which is very sensitive, at time zero is a better predictor of no disease five years out. So for, for screening purposes, it is a much more sensitive test and gives greater protection compared to cytology. But be aware at time zero, each one this is an almost identical percentage. So what's going to happen when we transition from cytology to HPV testing? A lot has been written about it, and I would encourage you to go and read these articles. The Australians and the Brits really have been at the forefront, and even some European countries. Uh, we're not there yet in the United States. But just to compare and contrast cytology with HPV testing, you will see that uh, one of the things is each one has issues with false negatives and false positives. 
We know more about cytology. We've been at it for 65 years. HPV is a new kid on the block. But one of the, one of the outcomes we are seeing with primary HPV screening is the increased colposcopy rate and the run on the colposcopy services. So I'm not telling you which one is better or worse. I'm just telling you these are the facts. There is no perfect test. And if you think there is a perfect test, uh, I don't know what you've been smoking. So moving on, quality improvement uses for HPV testing, and I use this extensively in my lab, and it is required by the College of American Pathologists uh, Laboratory Accreditation Program. So I use it for both uh, monitoring the rates and benchmarking my numbers to the national numbers and for cytology histology correlation purposes. So these are the national numbers that are published for the United States. Be aware that uh, positivity rates vary in different parts of the world. There's plenty. Uh, so you can actually use a combination of the ASCUS to SIL ratio and the HPV positivity rates on ASCUS to kind of monitor individuals and the lab. And depending on what combination you have, you can predict who's overcalling or undercalling and who's dangerous. So I will let you read that on your own. Uh, besides HPV testing, there's a lot of other molecular testing that goes on from the residual liquid in the liquid based vial. So people can argue whether liquid base is better than conventional PAP. That genie is out of the box because you can do so much more with the liquid based uh, residual in the vial. And of course, there are other ancillary testing that are available now, and one of them, the most promising, is P16 on cytology. So it's not just on histology material, but even on cytology. And you will see that the dual PAP can be uh, can have as high a negative predictive value as a DNA-based uh, test, with the most sensitive one being hybrid capture too. So if there is the, that is one one way, and I don't have time to discuss everything. So moving on to prevalence, as you can see, the prevalence varies in different parts of the world, and even on the same continent, it varies between um, the east coast or the west coast or the north part or the south part of that continent. And so it's really important to be aware. So if you're in a high prevalence region and everybody starts testing HPV positive, what are you going to do? You can't colposcope everyone. Moving on to vaccines, we've had some vaccine options for the last uh, decade or so. And they are made from the viral like particles to the L1 region. These are non infectious, they're very safe, irrespective of what uh, the anti vaccine people may say. Uh, and uh, we started off with Cervaxx and Gardasil 4, but now it's Gardasil 9. Uh, they've stopped manufacturing Gardasil 4. <coughs> it's to the nine types that are including, including the two uh, Loris 1, 6, and 11. And uh, they're very effective, especially when given at a younger age. But we don't know what's going to happen 40 years from now. Uh, there is some cross protection to the closely related group. We prefer vaccinating them early. But now there's actually an approval uh, for older women also. So uh, the age group keeps on widening. But for heaven's sake, please vaccinate your girls and boys at an early age before they become sexually active. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, although we would like, we, pred we were hoping we could be at that upper line with the slat slats, we're unfortunately not doing that well. And if you look at this table, which is the monthly morbidity and mortality weekly report from August of 2017, you will notice, notice that the very bottom line, the boys are doing even worse and the boys need to be vaccinated too. There's a very good review article on vaccines uh, by Diane Harper and Leslie DeMars. You can read that. I've given you the reference. Uh, so I would encourage you to read it. It's beyond the scope of this presentation. But cervical cancer screening is at crossroads. And there's a nice review article um, that I would encourage you to read. But basically, in a nutshell, what's going on is we have these non-vaccinated women who are not going to exit the screening age till almost 2050. And now you have the vaccinated women who are just beginning to enter the screening age. What do we do? Do we just screen them the same way now that we hope 1680 and a few others have been eradicated? What's the answer? 
Well, we have to continue screening the ones that are not vaccinated. But we still have to screen the vaccinated ones because, you know, we're just vaccinating them for the limited number. And I told you there are 40 anogenital tribes that are troublemakers. You also don't know the, the standard duration of the immunity. Think about whooping cough, you know. Um, if you were vaccinated 40 years ago, you probably need another shot now. So what's going to happen 40 years or 30 years from now? And the herd immunity status. Yes, there is a herd immunity when you reach 80, 90 percent vaccination rates. And that's happened in some communities. It's not happened, happening everywhere. And what about colposcopy? Currently, we use colposcopy as the gold standard. But once you take away 1680, is colposcopy going to be that golden? The reason I say that is 16 and 18 types give you the largest lesion. You take away the big ones. Now you're left with little bitty lesions high up in the canal that you're not going to see on colposcopy. So it's not going to be as useful. And maybe you should be doing ECCs. Well, we're certainly not there in the United States, but I'm hoping the Australians and the Brits and the Europeans will tell us what the next step will be in the vaccinated population. Unfortunately, there are parts of the world where there are no cervical screening cancer programs. There is no cytology infrastructure and HPV testing is too um, uh, expensive and vaccination is not available either because the government doesn't want to pay for it or whatever reasons. And those parts of the world, you have to adopt different strategies. And one of the things that's being looked at is self-collected specimen with HPV testing on those. There have been several trials in different parts of the world. This is the U.S. page uh, uh, seeking uh, people. And these self-collection devices look like different things. I just Googled this and found this. Uh, but you can see they can look like tampons or little tubes or space shuttles, whatever looking things. Uh, if, in fact, if you go to national meetings, you'll see vendors displaying these. So it's, it's, it's the next thing. Definitely. A self-collected specimen is not as good as a clinician-collected specimen. But if you use a high-throughput test, a high-throughput, very sensitive test, it's as good. And Jerome Burlinson from the Cleveland Clinic has done a lot of work on this. And I would encourage you to you read his paper. And here is one of them from China. Cytology is not as good on the self-collected specimen. But the important point that's made by these Australian authors that even a single round of screening halves the rate of cervical cancer and deaths from cancer by, by half compared to no screening at all. So even a single round is better than no screening. And there are various types of cards and collection devices and in which you can transport the specimens that are also being looked at. There are studies done in different parts of the world, Switzerland, Canada, you name it. <clears throat> so again, uh, I think that's the next frontier to get to women in areas where screening services are not available. And this has been, is being looked at in many parts of the world. So really, the future of cervical cancer screening and vaccination depends upon the resources. In high resource settings for the next 20 plus years, we still have to continue screening the unvaccinated group. The, but we have to still screen the vaccinated ones, but the strategy will have to change and the follow-up is going to be changed because is colposcopy going to be any good? And maybe a combination of P16, KI67 on the pap, a primary screen with that, or some sort of a reflex to a positive test. There are different strategies that are being looked at. No clear strategy has emerged. So in, 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 in summation, how did we go from PAP, which has been such a successful screening test and inexpensive to primary HPV screen? Well, actually, it didn't just happen. This was, there was a strategy behind this. And I encourage you to read this article. It, it was quite an eye opener for me. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made and it's still business. Uh, and we are in the business of saving lives and the companies have to respond to their stock owners. So interesting read. I encourage you to read it, especially if you have a long flight or something or you have time on your hands. <coughs> and with that, I will end. I would like to acknowledge certain people. Of course, Dr. Ramsey is my mentor. 
Uh, but there were others who influenced me, Dr. Harlan Spewt for surgical pathology. But more importantly, when it comes to HPV testing, it's Dr. Raymond Kaufman, who was the chair of OBGYN uh, at Baylor for the longest time. And he was an early adapter of HPV testing. Remember the old Virapap? He was doing those in the 90s when it, and he was one of the trial sites. And one of the things he discovered was when he did it in his clinic to everyone, something like 80% of the women tested positive. And he was like, he, said, he told me, Dina, this is a great test, but it's the prevalence that kills it. And I was like, what's he talking about? And I think we're beginning to see what he was talking about. You can't corpuscope every HPV positive woman. There has to be some strategy behind it. So time will tell. And with that, I will end, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Modi. That was excellent. I feel like I everything you need to know in, in a very concise fashion. So I, I, I learned a lot. I think our participants uh, likely did as well. I'd like to invite anyone who has any questions to uh, type them into the chat box, either uh, directed to me or to all participants, so I can read them to the speaker. Um, and you can also use the Q and A section if you find that first, but I prefer the chat if you could. Uh, so we'll, I'll, I'll let uh, the participants find uh, the chat box. It might take them, uh, you know, a half minute or so. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Modi, I know that you had mentioned several times with studies that. Uh, you know, H HPV testing uh, seems to be more sensitive than than the PAP test, or, or is more sensitive than PAP test at, at, with the qualifier at time zero. Um, do, in, do you use that qualifier primarily because there's not a lot of data outside of outside of that, or um, um, what 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 do we think if we're dealing with patients? Well, if you look at the studies, they clearly show that the. the that HPV testing is much more sensitive. But at time zero, we do know that each test misses a certain percentage. And now the data is coming out. So there's no perfect test. So if a woman is symptomatic, even when the pap test was negative, they still you know, did something about it. I think the same rule should apply to HPV testing. We're now discovering that there's a certain percentage, around nine to eight to ten percent, <coughs> on most uh, DNA testing platforms that are going to have false negatives for whatever reason at time zero. So if your patient is symptomatic or something is not right or she's a high risk patient, uh, don't just go by a negative test. There is no perfect test. So just like we knew with the PAP there were false negatives at time zero, you could have a negative HPV test in 8 to 10 percent of patients who potentially have serious disease. So you got to look at everything. Even co-testing misses 1%. So there's no perfect test. Um, thank you. Uh, so you have uh, two testing platforms uh, in, in your laboratories, that's correct? Yes. And uh, how, how do you, is one primarily used for clinical samples or used both for, for clinical samples? So here's the way it is. Uh, there are certain doctors who prefer the RNA-based platform, and they specify that, you know, there's a check mark electronically that you can mark if you want the RNA-based, the Aptima one. So those docs will go to Aptima. Everybody else gets the COBAS. That's my workhorse. I have two of those. They run 24 hours a day, six days a week. Okay, so with my volume, I need that. Because remember, I'm doing chlamydia gonorrhea also. Uh, because when we discovered our 9% false negative rate on that platform, we on our own implemented a strategy of tandem reflex testing. So if there's a co-test ordered and we have the cytology is a high grade or an ASCH or an EGC uh, or a low cell, uh, but the HPV comes back negative on the COBAS platform, the, there is a computer algorithm that suppresses that result, and that case is automatically sent to the Aptima platform, which has around a 3% false negative rate compared to the 9% we found. So if the Aptima is also negative, then the original COBAS result gets reported. The Aptima comes back positive on these tandem reflexes, as we call them. And actually, we've got a paper on that, which I think should be published by now. 
um, um, uh, they will if if the aptima is also negative the cobas results goes on but if the aptima is positive then that's the result that's reported and we eat the cost on that because we felt you know uh, with the five year screening intervals i don't think we should allow anyone to fall through the cracks but we eat the cost on that and does your laboratory running any primary HPV tests or your clinicians not request? So or? this is really interesting. We, we've we had the H primary HPV option, but uh, I get less than 15, one five requests a quarter when I look at my quarterly stats. Uh, and uh, so last year, I've had less than 100 requests for primary HPV screening, even though we've had that option since 2014 and now the u.s preventative task force also gives that option i think in the united states uh, we're a very litigious society um uh, so the no one wants to be the first, are a little right? nervous <laughs> about going to primary hpv screening there's this wait and watch game i think being played so i've, I've got less than 100 requests in 2018 uh Maybe it'll go up. Uh, I don't know. Well, thank you very much for answering those questions. I think uh, it's, it looks like our participants were, were blown away and had all their questions answered. But uh, for pe people that came in late or um, who want to review the lecture, in a day or two, it should be up on the uh, IAC website. Um, you'll be able to view it through the WebEx player. Um, and, and with that, I just want to really thank uh, Dr. Modi for taking the time uh, this morning to, to give her talk. And, and thanks to all the participants for uh, 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 being here to listen to it. Thank you, Dr. Van Bush, for inviting me. It was a pleasure.